All right, there's a story told of a truck driver. He stopped by a roadside diner for lunch, and he ordered a cheeseburger. He orders a small coffee and a slice of apple pie. Just as he's about to eat, three bikers walked in, and you can tell they're just up to no good. Without even hesitating, one of the bikers walks right up to the trucker. He grabs his cheeseburger, and he takes a bite from it. The truck driver looks at the biker and doesn't say a word. Well, aren't you going to say something, old man? The biker asked. The truck driver doesn't say a word. He picks up his coffee to take a drink, and when he does, the biker slaps it out of his hand, spilling the coffee all over the counter. The truck driver at this time looks up at the waitress. He says, well... It looks like I need to be going. Can I get the check? The biker looks at the truck, trucker and says, what a wimp you are. And he grabs the trucker's apple pie. He takes the pie and he goes to, his, to the table and he sits with his buddies that are sitting at the table right next to him. So the truck driver pays the bill and he leaves. After a few moments, the waitress walks up to the three men. They're sitting there talking about what just happened. They're laughing about what just happened. They're making fun of the truck driver. One of the men looks at the waitress and says, you know, he's not much of a man, is he? The waitress says, he's not much of a driver either. He just backed his 18-wheeler over three motorcycles. (laughs) Well, there you go. Don't mess with the truckers. Amen. (laughs) We're in the middle of a series right now called Set Free. And uh, two weeks ago, we, we, uh, we, we started to talk about how we can give Satan permission to operate in our life. We read Joel chapter 2 and verse 9, where he references the enemy. And this is what he says. You might remember this. It says, they swarm over the city. They run along its walls. They enter all the houses, climbing like thieves through the windows. So he talks about the enemy using open windows to gain access into the home. Spiritually, there are windows that we as believers can open, giving the enemy access to our home. That's what we talked about. We give him permission to operate in our life when we open these windows. Basically, we say, come on in. But before we realize what has happened, a lot of times the damage has been done. In 1 John chapter 2, we see that there are three primary windows we can open, given the enemy access. Nobody can open these, and nobody can close these, except for you in your life. You're the only one that can do this. This is your choice. And if these windows are open in your life, you cannot blame it on anybody. You cannot blame it on anything. We choose to open and close these windows. Two weeks ago, we discussed the first window, the window of pride. Today, we're going to talk about the other two windows. So I'm going to read 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 again, and then we're going to start to break it down. Here's what it says. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, here we go, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes... And the pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. I'm calling this message this morning, The Windows of Desire. Father, for the next few moments, I ask that you would give me the mind of Christ. God, that you would give me your anointing. For God, without your anointing, this message will fall flat. God, it will go nowhere, but Lord, if you anoint these words, they will change the hearts and lives of your people, Lord. And so, Father, that is what I pray today. I'm just your servant, God, and so I need your anointing. I need your touch today. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so here we see the three windows mentioned. Desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. Today, we're going to discuss what I like to call the desire of windows. We're going to discuss both of them. Although they are different, they do actually work hand in hand with each other, and the consequence of opening these windows is very similar. Now, the word desire comes from a Greek word that means lust or craving. It means to long for something. We can lust or desire over many different things. To lust after something is not just a sexual thing, although it can be. We can lust after food. 
We can lust after wealth. We can lust after a relationship. We can lust after material things, etc. Typically when this happens, when we lust after something, all common sense goes out the window. We convince ourselves that we have to have this thing, whatever it might be. We even convince ourselves sometimes that God wants us to have it. And so we long for it and we pursue it at all costs, not thinking about the consequences. Opening these windows is extremely destructive. The window of pride that we talked about two weeks ago is more of a subtle window. You can have the window of pride open and more than likely nobody's going to know. These two windows, however, are much different. When these windows are open, it's much harder to hide it from others. And because of that, marriages are destroyed. Families are ripped apart when these windows are opened. Reputations are damaged when these windows are opened. These open windows have the capacity, the capability to, to, to destroy your life. So let's talk about them. Here we go. The first people recorded in Scripture to open these windows was Adam and Eve. Let's read Genesis chapter 3, starting at verse number 1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the tree of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the tree of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good. Now watch what the woman does, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, there is a desire of the flesh, and that it was a delight to the eyes. There's the desire of the eyes. Satan is knocking at the window right now. The windows are not open yet. Right now it's just a thought in her mind. The desire is there, but she has not acted on it yet. She has not opened the windows. And that the tree was, be, was to be desired to make one wise. Desire of the flesh again, to be wise. She took of its fruit and she ate. Now the windows open. She gave some to her husband and he ate. He opened the window. Verse 7, then the eyes of both were opened. They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Now here's what's amazing about this. Most people tend to think that this was the only tree in the garden that was a delight to the eyes. That all the other trees were somehow garbage looking and had bad fruit. And this was the only one that was beautiful. That's not true. Look at, what, look at the previous chapter, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9. It says, And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge, and the tree of the knowledge and good, of good and evil. Now every tree that was in the garden, was pleasant to the sight. Every tree, every one of them. But Satan comes along and convinces her that there is something different about this one. This one is going to be better. His goal, now watch what he did, was to take her eyes off of what she did have. And he makes her focus on what she does not have. To desire what she does not have. To lust after what she did not have. Because if he could get her to do that, then she would open the window, giving him access to come in and destroy her. It's when you have a great spouse at home, and Satan withers in like the snake that he is, and he tries to get your attention onto someone else. He says, what about her over there? What about him? He doesn't want you to focus on what you have. He wants you to stay focused on what you do not have. Take, for instance, social media. Great, great case in point. You're sitting at home one night scrolling through all the highlights from people you barely know. 
You see all the great vacations. You see all the smiles. You see all the laughter. You see all the new stuff they are getting and you are not. You, on the other hand, you're extremely tired with two screaming children in the other room. The house is a wreck, so you're sitting there looking at this depressed. And a lot of people will tell you that the more they're on social media, the more depressed they get. So you're sitting there depressed. Here comes the snake watch, na- knocking on the window pane. Look at what you don't have. Satan wants you to focus on what you don't have because when you do, there's a greater chance that you'll open the window. Look at what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11. This is his defense against this. This is what he says. He says, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned, watch this, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Whatever I'm in, I'm learned to be content. I know how to be brought low. I've been on the bottom. And I know how to to abound. In every, any and every circumstance, doesn't matter what's going on around him, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. He's saying, I have been to the place where I have been starving, and I've been to the place where I've had abundance. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul says, regardless of where I am in life, regardless of what I have or what I don't have, regardless if I have a lot or if I have a little, I am going to be content and I am going to be thankful for what I have. It reminds me of this video. You might have seen it, but it illustrates this perfectly. Take a look at this. Always looking at what we don't have. Adam and Eve opens these windows, sin enters in. Death, destruction, and turmoil, that's the result of these windows being opened. They went from walking with God in the cool breeze of the garden to laboring in the thorns of the land without God. One decision, one open window, it cost them everything. We see this happen again in 2 Samuel chapter 11. It's a story of a man named David. David was a great king. He was a great warrior. He was a great man of God. 2 Samuel 11 and verse 1. It says, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and he was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw, here we go, from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. Desire of the eyes. Satan's knocking on the glass of the window pane right now. The window is not open. David has a choice to make. He can return to his couch or he can proceed to the window to open it. Verse 3, and David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Basically, she's married David. Let it go. Understand, David is the king. He has everything he could possibly want. Everything. But his mind is not on what he has. His mind is not on all that God has blessed him with. His mind is on the one thing he does not have, and he wants what he does not have. So David sent messengers and took her 
And she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanliness. So what happened? He just opened the window. Now with the window open, watch what happens. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived. She sent and told David, I'm pregnant. When are we doing the gender reveal? (laughs) Just kidding, it's not in there. There's no hiding this now. She's pregnant. Now, if you've never read this story, I'm not going to read it its entirety for time's sake, but I encourage you to go read it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great story. So David tries to cover up his sin by sending her husband Uriah to the front lines to fight in this war so that he can be killed. So in a roundabout way, David has her husband. David gets her pregnant and has her husband murdered. David then marries Bathsheba to finish the cover-up. He's trying to cover up his sin. But then we read this in verse 27. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. So God sent a prophet named Nathan to bring a word of correction to David. Nathan tells David that God's going to spare him, but his child's going to die. Short time after that, the child gets sick and dies. David opens the window, and what was the result? Death destruction, and turmoil. It would forever change the rest of his life. This is why opening these windows is so dangerous because what comes into your house with these windows open can literally change the course of your life. I know people that will die in prison because they open the windows of desire. I know people that have lost loved ones because they chose to open one or both of these windows. Every one of us in this room is going to hear the knocking on the glass, but it's your choice to open it. Amen, I'm trying. I love you. In the New Testament, Judas, one of Jesus' disciples, opened this window. Judas' desire was, was was of the flesh. It was money. He was greedy. He sold Jesus out for a few pieces of silver. He opens the window and afterwards he felt such remorse that he ties a noose from the tree and he hangs himself. Death, destruction, and turmoil once again. Now if you currently have these windows open in your life, we're going to talk about how to close them here in a moment. But before we do that, I want to talk to you about how to keep them closed. Because sometimes once you open these windows... The destructions that comes afterwards, it, 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 there's a lot of mess to pick up. And so how do you keep them closed to begin with? That's the question. How do we keep these closed? So the, in the book of Proverbs, David's son, King Solomon, witnesses something disturbing. He witnesses an individual that actually opens these windows and he talks about the progression that led up to it and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit he writes it down and practically all of chapter 7 is this story it's a wonderful story he writes it down as a warning to keep us from following this path to keep us from opening these windows so again, this account's found in the 7th chapter of Proverbs. It's truly remarkable when you break it down. So we're going to read this and kind of break it down as we go. Starting at verse number 1, Proverbs chapter 7. Follow my advice, my son. Always treasure my commands. Obey my commands and live. Guard my instructions as you guard your own eyes. Tie them on your fingers as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Love wisdom like a sister. Make insight a beloved member of your family. Let them protect you from an affair with an immoral woman, from listening to the flattery of a promiscuous woman. So Solomon starts off by talking about obedience. In this case, it's obedience to the Word of God. The Word of God will give you wisdom and insight you need to help protect you from following the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes. Obedience to the Word of God is what you need to keep these windows closed. The Word of God is referred to as a light unto our path. It directs you, it guides us to keep us on that path. Verse 6, while I was at the window of my house, here we go, looking through the curtain, I I I saw some naive young man and one in particular who lacked common sense. He was crossing the street near the house of an immoral woman 
strolling down the path by her house. It was at twilight in the evening as deep darkness fell. We talked about the evening wolf in another message. So Solomon the king, he's looking through the window. He's describing what he's witnessing. He sees a young man crossing the street near the house of an immoral woman. Everyone in town knows who this lady is and they know, they know what she does. So when this young man crosses the street to walk in front of her house, he knows who she is. This is not an oops. He knows what he's doing. Rather than steering clear of her house, as Paul instructs us to do in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 22, which, which reads this, stay away from every kind of evil. Rather than staying away, he puts himself into a position where it's now going to be more difficult to resist the temptation. So he's making himself a choice to put himself in this position. This is going to be like struggling with an addiction. You're trying to get free, but rather than avoiding certain places or certain people, like you know you need to do, you keep putting yourself right back in the middle of it. And that's what's happening with this young man. Remember, it's wisdom and insight from the Word of God that will protect you from this path. When we're told to stay away from every kind of evil, and when we choose not to do that, when we choose instead to flirt with evil, naturally it's going to be more difficult to keep these windows closed. Verse 10, the woman approached him, seductively dressed. There's the desire of the eyes. You can see it happening over and over again. And sly of heart. She was the brash, rebellious type, never content to stay home. She's often in the streets and the markets solicit, soliciting at every corner. Now watch. She threw her arms around him and kissed him. And with a brazen look, she said, I want to pause right there. Now I want you to see something. This is very important. This woman runs up to this man. She throws her arms around him and starts to kiss him. This would have been very unusual behavior back then, just like it would be unusual behavior today. I remember years ago, we took a trip to, a missions trip to uh, Peru, and I was asked to do the, speak the morning message, and I spoke through an interpreter, the missionary interpreted that morning. Um, but I remember after service, I had this, this lady come up to me, and she grabs my face, and she turns it, and she smacks a kiss right on the side of my cheek. I'm kind of freaked out by it. I'm like, what, what just happened? And so I kind of stepped back like that as my reaction. And the missionary said, just, just calm down. It's our culture. It's a sign of respect. And I said, well, praise God. I'm glad it's not on the lips. That would be very awkward. <laughs> but what I want you to see is it shocked me. I didn't expect that. Listen to me, when this woman comes up to this man on the street, she throws her arms around him and she kisses him. It should have shocked him. If someone does this to you after, ch after church in the lobby today, it's probably going to shock you. Somebody's probably going to get smacked for it, and rightfully so. But listen to me, there's a great truth here. Don't ignore this. The appearance of sin or immoral behavior should shock you. I believe this shock is the initial warning of God to tell us to get out of the situation and get out immediately. That shock that you feel, I believe, is his initial warning. Say, whoa, you're not in the right place. Take, for instance, you're scrolling through social media, and you see something. Maybe it's a photo of somebody wearing something that you didn't quite expect. Gives you a little jolt when you see it. In other words, you're a bit surprised. That's the initial warning to move on. If you stay and you start fulfilling the desires of the eyes, you start moving closer to the window. Take note of that little jolt, that little shock that you feel when you see or hear something. Because I believe that's a warning from the Holy Spirit to move on. It's a prodding. Take note of that. After kissing the young man, the woman makes a surprising statement. Look what she says in verse 14. She says, I've just made my peace offering and fulfilled my vows. You're the one I was looking for. I came out to find you, and here you are. Now, what does this mean? 
This is interesting. A peace offering at this time was a, was a sacrifice for an atonement of sin. So she has the appearance of a religious woman. She's active in the temple system. To put this into perspective, this would be an individual that's active in the church, and they say, if I do this, if we do this, God will forgive us. God will forgive me. And this type of behavior is not uncommon in the church today. We know what we're doing is wrong, but we choose to engage in it anyway because we want, to, we want to fulfill the desires of the flesh. And we say, God will forgive me. And here's what you need to understand. You are 100% correct. God will forgive you. But then we open the window allowing the enemy full access into our life. And then we mess up our life and we sit back and we wonder why God would allow this to happen to us. Paul himself confronts this type of attitude, this behavior in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. Here's what he says. He says, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Grace is not our free ticket to continue to live in sin. In the book of Revelation, Jesus calls this type of person lukewarm with the warning he's going to spit them out of his mouth. I mean, if we are walking in this method, we might as well pick up the hammer and the nails and nail the Savior to the cross all over again, because that's kind of what it's like. Oh, God will forgive me. Oh, God will forgive me. Oh, God, yes, God will forgive you. God loves you. But we open the window and we have this destruction. We allow this destruction to come in and the enemy destroys our life. And then we blame it on God. Verse 16 my, bread, my bed is sped with, spread with beautiful blankets with colored sheets of Egyptian linen. I perfume my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink our fill of love until morning. Let's enjoy each other's caresses. For my husband is not home. He's away on a long trip. He's taken a wallet full of money with him, and he won't return until later this month. So she seduced him with her pretty speech and enticed him with her flattery. flattery. She followed her. He followed her at once like an ox. So, man, she's come out. She said all this stuff to him. He says, let's do it. He follows her at once like an ox going to the slaughter. He was like a stag caught in a trap, awaiting the arrow that would pierce his heart. He was like a bird flying into a snare, little knowing it would cost him his life. And that's the result of these windows being open. Death, destruction, and turmoil. It's like an ox to the slaughter. You see how she convinces him? My husband's gone. He's on a long trip. In other words, don't worry. We won't get caught. You won't get caught. Nobody's going to know. Just one more look, one more innocent glance isn't going to hurt. Nobody's going to know. That's the lie of the windows of desire. That's what the snake will tell you as he knocks on the window pane. No one is watching. No one will know. But the truth that I need you to understand is there is someone watching. Now look at this parallel. This is phenomenal. In this case, here in Proverbs chapter 7, it was the king looking through the window glass watching and listening to everything. And the same thing in our case. It's the king of heaven and earth watching and listening to everything. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Rest assured that the true king that sits on the throne of heaven is watching. Solomon closes this by issuing another strong warning if we desire, desire to open these windows, he is trying everything he can to say, guys, keep these shut. Don't go there. 20, verse 7 and verse 24, or chapter 7, verse 24. So listen to me, my sons, and pay attention to my words. Don't let your heart stray away toward her. Don't wander down her wayward path. Stay away from those windows. For she has been the ruin of many 
Many men have been her victims. Her house is the road to the grave. Her bedroom is the den of death. There it is. That's the result of opening these windows in your life, death, destruction, and turmoil. So the goal is to keep these windows closed, of course. But now what do you do if you've opened the windows? How do you get them closed again? And here's where it gets kind of challenging because I believe from what I can see in Scripture, in order to close these windows after a lot of damage has been done, you're going to need help to close these windows. Quite different from the, from the window of pride because the window of pride we're told to humble ourselves and that's how we close it, but not these two. In the case of Judas, he never did get it closed. He killed himself. In the case of David, it was Nathan the prophet that came and they showed him the error of his way. David repented, thus closing the window, but the damage had been done. He never did get his son back. He would always suffer the loss of his son. But there's hope. These windows can be closed. Because if you remember, Adam and Eve were the first ones to open these windows. When they did, death, destruction, turmoil entered our world. This would cause major damage not only to them, but for all mankind. They could not close these windows themselves. In fact, for years they were left open. And because of that, there would be much death, destruction, and it was never meant to be that way. For example, thousands and thousands, probably millions of animals would be killed as a sin offering to cover up the sins of the people. The altars were set up to to, to, to provide these sacrifices. There was much death due to sin, due to these windows being open. So God, in His great love for us, He sends His only Son, Jesus, to shut the windows that we opened. He sent Jesus to this earth as the ultimate sacrifice, as the final sacrifice, shutting the windows once and for all for those that accept Him as Lord and Savior. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 17 says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead, but he laid his right hand on me and he said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. Jesus shut the windows of desire, and today he holds the keys to death and the grave, but even though he shut the windows... We're still witnessing the aftermath of the decision to open them. Today, there's still death, there's still destruction, there's still turmoil. It's because we can still make the decision to reopen these windows ourselves. Jesus has paid the price to shut them, but we can choose to open them back up. However, because Jesus paid the price to shut these windows, and because Jesus now holds the keys to death and the grave, Jesus has the power to shut them again. You open the windows, but he has the authority and the power to shut them. Not only does he have the power to shut them, but he has the power to restore to everything that you have lost with those windows being opened. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. That's what happens when he shuts the windows. Amen. Dave, I'm going to have you come on back up at this time. I'm going to close with this story. You may remember the story of David Berkowitz, better known as the son of Sam. American serial killer back in the mid-1970s, he led police on a manhunt as he committed random shootings throughout New York City, wounding, killing six people. In taunting letters, he claimed his neighbor's dog instructed him to kill pretty young girls. Later, he confessed that the rituals were related to a satanic cult. He's currently serving six 25 to life sentences for murder. He opened the windows of desire. But one night in 1987, nearly 10 years after the murders, he was reading Psalm chapter 34, and he had an encounter with Jesus. He writes, When I got up, it felt as if a very heavy but invisible chain that had been around me for years had been broken. It was gone. And today, although he'll live the rest of his life behind bars, today he's known as a 
as a prison evangelist. He's been renamed by the inmates, the son of hope. And he's known for counseling young people within the prison system and giving them hope. So he opened the windows of desire. And because he did that, he's still paying the consequence for his action. You need to understand that. It doesn't just go away. He's still paying the consequence for his action. But he surrendered his life to Jesus Christ, allowing God to shut them damage done. Spiritually speaking, he became brand new as we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. So even though he's still walking through the muck of his decisions in the eyes of God, he's brand new. You see, there was hope for him and the same hope for him is the same hope that God has for you. It doesn't matter what you've done. God has the power to restore what you've lost if you let him. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, we just want to thank you for your word. God, thank you that we can be encouraged. For I believe, Lord, that I know there's people in here that have opened these windows. God, I just pray, Lord, that they would have the hope today that through you, they can be restored, they can be made new. You're the only one, God, that can restore us. These windows are so destructive. And God, I just sense right now that there's some people in this room or maybe even watching online that have been toying with these two windows. They've been flirting with these two windows in some part of their life. And I don't know what it is, but God, you do. And Lord, I just believe that you're speaking to them right now. And through the example that we see from Solomon in Proverbs chapter 7 as that warning to, to stay away, God, it is my prayer that, Holy Spirit, you're moving upon those that are flirting with these windows right now and you're opening their eyes to the damage and the destruction. And God, that they will have the strength today to walk away and say, I'm not going down that path. I thank you for it today in Jesus' name. I want you to keep your head bowed and your eyes closed. Before we close this message today, I want to give you a chance to get your life right with God. I never like closing a message without giving you this opportunity. Because I believe that there's people in here today that you that you're far from God. You need God in your life, you need God in your life bad. Maybe you've opened these windows you need his help to shut them there's been damage there's been turmoil it's God's telling you today I can make you brand new I can make you brand new there's nothing that you could do to make me not love you it's what God's telling you today and so if that's you if you're in here today and you need God in your life I want to give you a chance to get your life right with God before you leave this place I want you to know that you're right, right standing with God when you leave this place today. And so if that's you, if you're ready to confess that, that you're a sinner to God, say, God, I'm a sinner. You're ready to confess Him with your mouth. You're ready to confess Him as your Lord. If that's you, if you're ready to surrender your life, then I want to pray with you before you leave this place. And just so I know who I'm praying for, every head bowed and every eye closed, what I'm going to do is I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, if that's you, if you say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm ready to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. Would you pray for me? On the count of three, if that's you, I want you to lift your hand because I want to see who I'm praying for today. That we're going to pray. And we're going to ask Jesus Christ to come into our life. The Word of God tells us that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that He rose from the dead, we will be saved. And that's what we're going to do through this prayer is we're going to confess that Jesus Christ is our Lord. I'm going to lead you in that. So on the count of three, if that's you, I want to see your hand. I want to see who I'm praying for today. No one's looking around this between you and God right now. One, two, three. Right now, just put your hands up. Put your hands up. Put your, we got several hands going up right now. Thank you, Jesus. Several of you are saying, yes, I need God in my life. You can put your hands down. Now, if you just lifted your hand. Like I said, I'm going to lead you. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to say this prayer, and I want you to say this with me out loud. 
I want you to be bold. I'm going to see if you mean business right now. If you didn't lift your hand, I encourage you to say this with them to encourage them today. But this is this moment's between you and God right now. This isn't between me and you. I cannot save you. I can just lead you to him, to the one that can. So this is a moment between you and Jesus right now. So I'm going to say this, and I want you to repeat this out loud after me. Say this. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today, and I confess that I'm a sinner. I have sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven. And today, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to cleanse me. I ask you to make me brand new, like your word says. Today, Jesus, you are my Lord, my God, and my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me from my sin and for setting me free. Today, I am yours. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Can we celebrate what God has done?